Thank you for joining Once Changing World, India's first Future Tech Meets Sustainability podcast. And today, delighted to have with me, Mr. Siddhant Dangle, who's the CEO and founder at Next10.ai, a brain-computer interface startup. And their mission is to revolutionize the field of neuroscience, healthcare, education, gaming, and beyond through their comprehensive BCI ecosystem. Next time, launched V1, a non-invasive EEG recording device in March 2022. And Instinct V2 in 2024. Next time, Instinct is a BCI platform that features advanced EEG hardware and operating system designed for biosignals and a developer-friendly SDK to accelerate the creation of applications. Next time, envisions a world where human-machine collaboration knows no boundaries and enable technology that connects minds and machine. The topic of conversation today is going to be BCI, its unbound potential, both positives as well as negatives. So Siddhant, really, really appreciate you taking time being part of the podcast. In your profile, it mentioned that your journey started with a mind-controlled prosthetic arm for yeah. military amputees. You know? So I think it'll be great yeah. if you could start with that. Where does that uh, project uh, stand at this point? Because I had I had a conversation, I think maybe last year with Dr. Max Otis, who it seems built the world's first mind-controlled bi-directional bionic arm. And this was mm. above the elbow. So would love to know yeah. about your mind-controlled prosthetic arm. So there's a tech talk from this guy, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, Greg Gage. Uh, in which uh, he works on, you know, controlling the limbs of a cockroach uh, using signals. So we thought, okay, we can also use something similar to create a prosthetic arm, uh, manipulate a person's EMG signals, mo- like monitor them to make them control a prosthetic arm. And we were extremely happy that, wow, such an amazing idea. No one would have ever done that before. Uh, went on to Google and uh, we found out all the prosthetic arms right now available in the market use exactly this methodology of EMG signals, which is your muscles. And then like, but uh, you know, we, uh, me and the Dipash were also like, nah, this can't be it. If, if the solution already exists, why don't we see it? Uh, we see a lot of amputees, but we don't see a lot of solutions. Uh, there must be something wrong, something that we are missing. Uh, so we decided to dig deeper. Um, and essentially we found out a- exactly this. So, you know, muscle control systems have essentially three problems. One is they are muscle controlled, which means for every single action that you have to do, let's say you want to pick up a 10 gram object like a pen, you have to flex your biceps to engage the prosthetic arm to do a particular action. And no matter how healthy, no matter how strong you are, flexing your biceps is not an easy. The government of India gives a huge subsidy on these uh, prosthetic arms. These muscle control prosthetic arms are actually very expensive. Uh, Autobox sells them for uh, twenty to thirty thousand dollars. It's super expensive, uh, right? Uh, and government of India gives a huge subsidy on these, and in some cases they even just give it for free for uh, a couple of amputees. Uh, <clears throat> but the reality is that people prefer picking things with their elbows than using those prosthetic. Because those prosthetic arms essentially just drain their muscle and causes mu- a muscle atrophy, uh, right? So they prefer throwing these expensive, uh, amazingly engineered biomechanical robots and doing things using their elbows. And uh, that's where we came like, okay, the problem is essentially atrophy, like uh, muscle strain. That's the problem. What if we remove that from the equation? What if we are able to, uh, you know, get that muscle information from somewhere else? Uh, and that's where the brain comes into the picture. And uh, so this is way back in 2017. And nowadays, almost everyone knows about BCI because of Neuralink. Uh, back then, um, there was hardly any research uh, publicly available. Private research, a lot of uh, it was available. But uh, publicly available, uh, available research was limited. So me and the punch decided that, okay, yeah, this is uh, what we are going to do. We are, are going to create a mind-controlled prosthetic arm in which we take the signals from the brain, interpret them, and use that interpretation to essentially control a prosthetic arm. When we were starting, that's when we realized the uh, core problems, which is EEG or brain signals uh, are difficult. Your hair on the skull, your oil content, dandruff, dead skin, uh, 
are all contributors to noise. The biggest contributors to noise are your face, is your face, facial muscles. You blinking your eye is enough to destroy the signal intake. The second issue with EEG is it's expensive. And the third bit of problem around EEG uh, that we realized was uh, it's, it's accessible. The current form factor of EEG, uh, the medical grade systems, uh, they put a gel. So that gel is essential to increase the conductivity. These wet systems essentially require a lot of like, careful placement. And uh, because on your brain, there are 84 billion neurons. And every single sensor that you place or electrode that you place refers to a bunch of them. Uh, right. So if you if it is supposed to be hair and you just put it one centimeter away, signals that you're going to get are not what you are hoping for. Uh, they're going to be completely different. Uh, right. So location matters a lot when it comes to uh, headsets and everything else. And these wet systems essentially require this precision and the wetness of the systems mean that it's not accessible to everyone. And the last thing that we realized that uh, prosthetic arm when we were building that, we built a successful product, uh, like uh, prototype of our prosthetic arm from uh, a grant from Lockheed Martin. Um, so in that prosthetic arm, basically, that was all, uh, able to do four actions, lift the four fingers and essentially reset based on your uh, thought process itself. Left, right, up, down, left is, if you think left, it's associated with one finger, right associated with another finger, so on and so forth. We built that, we tested it out on a couple of amplies also. Uh, but uh, during this exercise, we realized that, yeah, we are good at neuroscience, we are good at electronics, but we are extremely bad at mechanical. Uh, that's not a forte. Mm. And the other thing that we realized is that this same algorithm that we created right now, left, right, up, down, can be used for a thousand different things. It can be used for gaming, it can be used for home automation, it can be used for wheelchair assistance. There are a thousand different things that the same algorithm can be used for. We decided that instead of uh, you know focusing on a prosthetic arm, we should focus more on the neuroscience side of things, and that's how the next time was essentially. Right, uh, Siddharth, thank you for kind of uh, explaining your journey, and I, I guess uh, tinkering around with the idea of building a mind control prosthetic bionic arm well, opened up your inroads or understanding of like maybe using the same tech stack and building something which is more uh, uh, something which is going to be more impactful and, and you rightfully pointed out I mean you know the, these bionic arms I mean still I think some of the the best scientists in the world are still grappling on what could be the ideal bionic arm which works seamlessly as like our own human arm you know yeah. And, and and like you you, you you pointed out, I mean, you know, even through your your like maybe your in, invasive or non-invasive devices, there are still lots of issues of uh, understanding the 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 brain signal firing and maybe yeah. using it to kind of you know creating the these motions and algorithms so that you know the these bionic arms works properly so yes i think we we still have lots of challenges lots of issues still to uh, sort out but I, i'm glad that you know uh, entrepreneurs uh, researchers such as yourself around the world are kind of tinkering around with these uh, brave thoughts on how we can, you know, solve these big, big problems, you know, because you, you rightfully pointed yeah. out that there are millions in the world who, who are a a amputees. And I, I guess, I mean, the, the best way to kind of address that and uh, give the opportunity of these disabled people, you know, to uh, mix into a world seamlessly would be through these uh, tech stacks such as brain computer in in interface. Huh? It will be great if you can kind of, you know, give an overview of what a brain computer interface is actually, you know, and then break it down into the invasive, non-invasive and the semi-invasive uh, BCI and, uh, and what can you do? Yeah, yeah Eddie. like uh, before uh, like I get into BCIs, like I'll just add one more thing uh, to your previous part itself. Uh, you see, when it comes to the human brain, right, uh, we humans don't lo know a lot about it. Uh, uh, like amputation is one example, like, uh, you know, a perfect abanic arm in which we are working in tandem with the nervous system of the person. Uh, that's a dream for now. Uh, uh, 
uh, right? We don't know a lot of about uh, human brain. We don't know like Alzheimer's, epilepsy, schizophrenia. Millions of people around the world suffer from these diseases. We still till date we don't know what causes them. We have no clue uh, why a person uh, gets schizophrenic. We have no clue why a person gets Alzheimer's. We are still trying to answer those questions. Like, and those are okay, still medical uh, relevant questions. One thirtieth of uh, your life is going into dreaming. We don't know where. Why do we do that? We have no clue. Uh, so uh, we have like, and on this, the simple reason why we have no clue is uh, you know, like we know a lot about uh, the human heart. Uh, we know so much about the human heart that we can literally recreate it. We can use a pig's heart as a replacement because the heart still works after the person is dead. Mm, right, you just need to give it power, juice, and it starts pumping. It's a pump. Uh, with the human brain, the problem is we can't understand the human brain once the like you know doing an autopsy on a person um, uh, who passed away. Uh, you won't get any information out of that person's brain. The only way you can get information out of the out of a person's brain is when the person is alive. Uh, and that's where like now from here I'll join BCI. That's where BCI comes in. So BCIs are a way to do that. So like uh, there are many types of, uh, so BCI is essentially is signal in, collect signals from the brain, uh, interpret it, machine learning models, computation models, uh, statistics. Most of the times, uh, if you look at it, BCI models tend to be more of uh, statistics uh, than uh, deep learning. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, finally just, using that output uh, to do an interaction on a computer. That's a brain computer interface, uh, right? So now there are multiple ways to collect EEG signals, uh, sorry, brain signals from your brain. I'll tell you like, oh, uh, the first one is essentially like uh, EEG. EEG is the simplest, the safest one. It's completely non-invasive and it has no side effects, no nothing, uh, right? But the way ECG, EEG essentially works is, Inside your brain, I told you, you know there are eighty-four billion neurons. Uh, when you uh, like when a neuron fires inside your brain, uh, it gets activated due to a thought or a metabolic activity or a hormone release, whatever the case be. A positive ion goes from one end of the neuron to the other end of the neuron, uh, and the positive ion is generally potassium or uh, uh, sodium. That's why it's important to eat bananas, uh, right? Now there is an axis of positive ions on one end and a deficient of uh, deficit of uh, positive ions on the other end. Now, all the engineers know this, that this thing is called a dipole moment. And a dipole moment has an electric field, which goes from zero to infinity. Uh, right. Measuring that electric field is EEG. You know, actually ECG is also literally the same thing. When you're measuring this electric field from the heart muscles, it's called ECG. When you're doing it for uh, neurons, it's called EEG. Uh, their amplitudes are different. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is called EEG. Now there are other methodologies like uh, FNIFS. Uh, it stands for Near Infrared Spectroscopy. Uh, that is essentially, you know, shining lasers inside the brain. Now, when you uh, near infrared laser, when it goes through your brain, the amount of blood in your blood vessels on your brain uh, will change how much reflection comes back. Right, basically how uh, LiDAR works, uh, yeah, right? Same principle. Uh, and based on how much blood is flowing in one part of the brain, you can more or less tell the activity uh, at that portion, like whether there is activity in, in that portion of the brain or not. Uh, then there are uh, things like CT scans, uh, PET scanners, MEG scanners, uh, which are all uh, different methodologies of essentially measuring the same thing, which is the electrical impulses inside your brain. So these are all non-invasive methods. Then comes the invasive one. You know, with the human brain, the problem essentially lies with the fact uh, is uh, when neurons fire, right? A neuron firing over here, and let's say you have put up an electrode over here. A neuron fire over, firing over here will also have its effect shown in this electrode. And a, ne a neuron firing over here will also show its effect on this electrode. And that's why you need multiple sensors so that you can start segmenting them out, you know, uh, do that space, uh, spatial localization. 
now ideally you would need 84 billion electrons because that's the number of neurons we have which is impossible you can't have 84 billion electrons uh, no matter what uh, and so that that's where invasive comes in, into the picture the other problem why invasive is uh, kind of cool is our brain has something called uh, cerebral uh, spinal fluid and the then the skull they essentially kind of distort the signals when uh, the electric fields are passing through them invasively what you can do is you can just target small area of the brain that okay this area now instead of working with 84 billion neurons you choose that okay i am going to just work with 100000 neurons and for those 100000 neurons i am going to place 1000 electrodes <clears throat> you can't place 1000 electrodes on a person's skull you won't get anything the only way to do that is going going inside the brain and you're spreading those electrodes on the surface of the brain ah because then you solve the problem of hair you solve the problem of oil you solve the problem of external light and you also solve the problem of uh, area that you have to work so that's where non invasive and invasive come come into the picture uh, next time basically works with the philosophy of uh, like uh, simple philosophy that any why are you wearing spectacles why didn't you do lasik uh, <clears throat> we understand that invasive is uh, better but at the same time invasive does require surgery uh, right uh, so there is always a risk involved and uh, frankly put uh, uh neuralink synchron paratromix uh uh <clears throat> they all amazing companies uh, especially like i would give a huge shout out to synchron those guys that are amazing their innovation is just on next level uh but they're still in trials uh when yeah. someone is in trials which uh, that essentially means that something somewhere has failed uh <clears throat> right uh so our logic is that okay non invasive might not be 100% but it's still 70% of what invasive it has a lesser uh, uh you know degree of uh, risk involved right right so sadat completely appreciate you kind of explaining both uh, uh invasive as well as non invasive and i think both of these technology has its own pros and cons like you mentioned non invasive it has this problem where it cannot actually read up your entire uh, firing and wiring of what's happening in, on the entire brain wh- wh- wherein uh, invasive has its own uh, benefits that it can get better a uh, signal uh, ratio uh, c- cover better ra- and, and possibly like i i think i mean at this point in time uh, uh, the 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 companies that you mentioned you know from neuralink to paradromics to synchron to precision neuro- neuroscience I, i think they are all i think the cusp of understanding a human brain i mean you said that we do not completely understand a human brain i would not uh, agree with you I, i think yes you've got 84 billion neurons 100 trillion synapses the way the fire and wire brings out a sight sound touch smell space uh, all of five senses and i think there are uh, uh, scientists researchers around the world who are taking different approaches to kind of understand a human brain one is the connectomics uh, project where people are looking at taking you know your your c elegant worm which has got somewhere around 302 neurons they have con- completely mapped out the entire yeah. neuron and in fact not just mapped it out they have actually created a simulation i think back yeah. in 2000 Uh, 16 or maybe before that and now before now the connectomics has moved from a c elegant worm to a a a fruit fly they're doing a a, a mouse in fact google with harvard recently did the connectomics of a, mi- uh, a micro uh, uh, millimeter of a, the, the human brain so i i think slowly and steadily i think humans are, are are uh, trying to you know figure out and understand the most complicated part of the human anatomy which is the brain you know and, and I, i'm sure that maybe a, a possibly in the next 50 years 100 years maybe we will get to a point yeah. where we will understand the entire human brain maybe not but i i think there are these researchers who are constantly 
we, you know, uh, figuring out. So I think to each his own, whether it's the invasive or the non-invasive, I think the both are progressing in in their own, uh, you know, directional or research path. I guess we are all trying to kind of figure out the language of the brain. And I believe like how, like every language, like ABCD, I mean, you know, even with maths or even with coding, I'm sure with uh, neural firings, you know, there's a language like how the uh, there, there's these uh, uh, the neurons firing, and I'm sure with the progress of humans uh, converging with AI, uh, there will be a lot of uh, or, or data will be interpretable. Yeah. You know, spe- especially or, or, or brain data, and and yeah. I th- I think that in in conjunction with connectomics will obviously help a lot. So so I think there is some great things happening in the field of technology, and I think in the ne- next possibly decade there, there's there's going to be some really really great uh innovation would love to know your v1 how many copies it was sold uh what was the most interesting ways the v1 was uh used and also if you can talk about your v2 next time instinct yep yep uh definitely uh eddie but uh before that like uh you know when you're talking about uh uh, all these uh, like uh, everyone working together to you know kind of uh, kind of understand the human. Uh, whenever uh, like any investor asks us who's your competitor, my response is always the same. In neuroscience, there are no competitors. Everyone is actually working together uh, to solve these uh, same problem. Uh, <clears throat> because uh, yeah, everyone is trying uh, what they uh, know uh, to do the best. We don't know which one is the winner right now. Uh, maybe uh, Synchron's methodology of invasive is the winner. Uh, maybe next time's methodology of EEG is the winner. Uh, that is not known, but everyone essentially is right now trying to make life easier for those smart people uh, who know uh, how to look at the human brain. Uh, that's what everyone is essentially trying to do. And that brings me here yeah, to our V1. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, V1, we uh, shipped out around 70 copies to uh, like multiple university professors. Uh, those smart people, uh, uh, you know, to try uh, try it out, give us their feedback, what needs to be improved and all that stuff. Uh, and we saw some amazing use cases. So there was this team based out of a university, uh, Santa Clara University. They were essentially uh, working on the principle of, they will collect the signals, interpret the emotional state of a person. And based on that emotional interpretation, they will replay sounds and uh, give visual stimuli to the person to essentially trick the person's brain to re- into releasing more uh, serotonin and essentially reducing their anxiety. So a good uh, like uh, it's a completely closed loop solution to solve for and completely non-invasive to solve for anxiety. And they got uh, a decent success with it as well. And they're continuing their research forward and uh, have gotten a lot of uh, research plan for their project. Uh, there's a team which is working on creating a horror game. Uh, this is one of the most interesting use cases to date I have ever seen. Um, they're working on creating a horror game in which the story of the game, you know, uh, the jump scares inside the game are not predetermined. Those jump scares are dynamic and they are triggered on the basis of uh, your emotional state. Uh, like what's going in your head, uh, that's what triggers uh, the jump scare. So which essentially means every single time you play that game, you're going to get a brand new experience because no two days are identical, uh, which means no two days your mental state is exactly the same. And yeah, these are the like uh, two interesting use cases that we saw. Most of the other use cases were around uh, like simple things like, uh, you know, controlling a drone using parts, uh, uh, we saw a lot of use cases on neurofeedback side. What type of meditation you should do so that you get the best effect. Uh, this is when neurofeedback is used in the context of mental health. Uh, but neurofeedback can also be used in context of uh, like stroke rehabilitation. It can be used in the context of Alzheimer's, it can be used in the context of uh, schizophrenia. But most of the use cases that we saw were uh, neurofeedback in context of mental health, which is quantitative meditation. So these were the primary use cases that we saw with our V1. V2, the instinct. Uh, <laughs> simply put, we are not, next time is not the one who designed the instinct platform. The V1 customers are the one who designed the instinct platform. You know, like from every single feature, 
uh, such as motorized electrodes uh, that we added into our uh, instinct platform um, or the onboard compute that we added or the number of channels that why are we having 19 channels uh, <clears throat> the sdk form that was all determined based on the uh, v1 customers feedback and their inputs and our conversations with them Right. Yeah, yeah. I would love, love, love to you to uh, get into uh, you know V two a little bit more. But I yes, I I, I think I mean uh, you know kudos to your team for putting the V one together. And I think the best way for a product to evolve is, is giving it into the hands of the customers and letting them decide and, and nudge you towards you know your your next iteration. And I think you guys have done that, so I would love to un, uh, you know experience uh, V two. And you mentioned about AR VR. I've been invested in AR VR since two thousand sixteen. In two thousand sixteen, we had built our sixteen camera rig uh, when Google, Facebook were building uh, their their stereoscopic VR camera. We had built built in india or 16 camera virtual reality uh, rig and we had also built a, a robotic dolly and this was too early into the ecosystem i directly yeah. produced india's first telescopic vr for a short film called crackle it's won the best vr film at the miami uh, fear fest it's done the festival circuit and the reason i'm mentioning about my uh, the, the the vr hardware is hardware is very very difficult yeah. to build a and <clears throat> when i i was doing this crackle horror film I was imagining how you could make this experience more experiential because you know I had scenes where it, it's a virtual reality a horror film. You know I had scenes where people are coming from behind. So I I was thinking how you could leverage haptic feedback or possibly brain computer interface. But those days it was too too early. Yeah. I mean and too. But I'm glad that and I mean through your system you're saying you know there are the people who are actually leveraged. Uh, uh uh for uh, these dynamic uh, horror experiences yeah. so so really really excited about you know this convergence of tech stack where you know ar <clears throat> vr mr ai bci is going to meet you know because i i feel that i mean you know uh black mirror is, is like a documentary of sorts you know because i mean it, yeah. it's not like a series series you know because whatever that the black mirror is kind of uh, shown i think we are yeah. going we, we are going towards that yeah so so yeah we do would love to uh, you know have you unwrap uh, v2 yeah yeah before like i uh, start about that uh... Uh, when you said that AI, BCI, AR, VR, MR, all of these converging together, uh, you know, that's the like uh, one of the other things that attracted me towards neuroscience. Mm, if you look at neuroscience uh, from a broader concept, it's like literally a conversion of physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics, and philosophy. Mm. <laughs> like uh, most of the neuroscience Matrix. Is, uh, conversations start with a philosophical question. That what is consciousness? What is memory? So it's the perfect combination of all of these sciences, and in terms of technology, as you said, like it's a good place to converge things together and you know create the next human. Actually, that's where the you know, our, our name comes from. Comes essentially, our name is next stem. So stem is brain stem is that portion of your body which can uh, like you know connects your brain to your spinal cord and rest of your body. So it's like the bridge between your brain and your human body. Uh, so we are like next stem, the bridge between the brain and the machine. So that's how our name actually also. Um, but yeah, I'll uh, carry forward into our uh, instinct uh, platform. So uh, you remember like uh, when we started out our conversation, I talked a lot about like uh, that EEG is hard. Uh, there are a lot of like uh, problems in terms of like uh, getting, you know, the perfect signal. Uh, facial expression, your movements, they just destroy signal integrity and the location of the electrodes matters a lot. lot. So to solve for that, we decided that instead of depending upon a trained person uh, to put on the headset, that it always goes in the right place, uh, let's just uh, make them uh, motorized. And for that, we essentially do inspiration from uh, our cameras. Um, you know, cameras have that optical image stabilization thing that your hand is shaking, but the camera remains still. Yeah, that's the same thing that we actually have implemented for our electrodes. Apart from capturing EEG data, we also capture something called impedance, you know, uh, skin impedance. Uh, and that skin impedance basically tells us how good the contact is. And we know that for our type of electrodes and for our electronics, 
the perfect impedance needs to be this you know uh, like uh, you have to do impedance matching uh, <clears throat> so what we essentially do is we tell our electrodes to target that impedance uh, so it moves up and down it uh, wiggles a little bit you know wiggles to move the hairs around scratches your skull to remove dandruff and oil from all of that place uh, so that we are able to you know get that perfect impedance we are able to get that perfect uh, position uh which gives us the best possible signal quality and the other added advantage of this is uh, now you you have an eeg system uh which you can wear while walking right now you can't wear any eeg system while walking because the movement just destroys the signal integrity but now over here the motors are actively working against your motion now huh. it will obviously add some noise artifacts but these noise artifacts are 10 times less then what you would have originally get without uh, the kind of electrodes that we have created so uh, and the idea of adding this motor as electrodes actually just came from our few one customers when they said that uh, uh, the headset is sometimes uh, like people with silky hair no the headset used to slip off from their heads that feedback essentially uh, gave us uh, this inspiration to add motor as electrodes and then that uh, horror company uh gave us the inspiration to add our second biggest feature uh which is onboard compute so far like next time is the only eeg device in the market which has onboard compute uh what that essentially means is you know right now how researchers carry out their research is they ca- capture eeg data and then they do offline analysis right they don't do real time work people who are doing a real time work depend on a secondary computer apart from their eeg device to do all the real time computations and uh, the consumer eeg headsets depend on a cloud service to do that or uh, uh, i our v1 was also dependent on cloud now i'll take those whole uh, horror game guys as an example uh <clears throat> it took 300 to 400 milliseconds to get an inference back from the cloud which means everything was happening at a delayed level in their game and that's what like i was like okay yeah this is actually a real problem and gaming is one use case but uh, the use case like a prosthetic arm a use case like a wheelchair where again latency is very very important uh, a use case like uh, you know speech assistance for the uh, patients with cerebral palsy latency is very important that's why we decided to add an 8 core arm processor inside the head uh, it was a very like you know challenging task uh, i would be uh, <laughs> and the biggest challenge into this was the motherboard that we created to fit that 8 core arm processor can be manufactured by only one vendor in india uh, so uh, like uh, uh, but uh, yeah it's an uh, we added an 8 core arm processor and then we added uh, an ai accelerator so that all of your machine learning models all of your mathematical computation your signal processing and dots can run inside the device and this also like you know falls in the direction of uh, um compliance uh like privacy because now the person's data is never going somewhere it's always staying in the device and that's what, how we like to keep it uh because we believe that if we today set the wrong example of that yeah eeg data can be freely transferred then later on uh and i think so it's a responsibility of every company which is you know in the early stages of new design um that don't say the president that uh, eeg data is freely transferable because later on when actually like we understand what that data means uh it would be very hard to backtrack and you know correct the things that have been wrong uh so we take that seriously as well uh, you know privacy we don't uh, uh uh like take any of the customers data the only thing that we are taking from the device are the cpu load and the battery levels so that you know we can essentially choose batteries better in the future right now we are uh, like just a test bench we are like okay this battery lasted for 6 hours okay then we are going to go with this one uh, it might be that there are better batteries or it might be the case that no one is using it for 6 hours and even in happy with 4 hours then we can reduce the weight uh <clears throat> so yeah uh, the other thing uh, into v2 is essentially in the instinct uh as i said like we want to make it as an infrastructure uh, we don't want to make it as a product 
uh, now the thing is every single person likes their has their own personal programming language uh, for writing stuff down uh, for developing some someone uses python someone uses c++ someone uses matlab matlab is used a lot in the near sense that's true now we have two options one is write everything every algorithm that we are creating or you know we create those atomic blocks small blocks which uh, uh someone else can use to you know create a bigger pipeline uh to draw more more uh, information out of the now we have two options that we write all of those blocks in every programming language uh, that is out there or in that case obviously we'll have to miss out on uh, like uh, some people and then well, then comes the second part we know the hardware of our system right uh, we know the arm processor that's there we know its instructions and everything so we know that c++ when used in this way is going to give you the best computational result so what we decided to do is like all the blocks that we are writing we'll write them only in c++ and then run them as system services now uh, right so that our developers our customers can use any programming language they want they are just making Uh, api calls they are just making api calls to those system services mm. so they are getting the both the advantage of the hardware acceleration that we have built into our uh, algorithms and the comfort of using their own favorite programming language right um and now when this concept of system services came into the picture that's when we realized that we need to create our own operating system uh and we did uh, so that's called instinct os and that's the operating system that runs inside the heads and uh simply if I, someone asked me uh explain instinct uh, to me in one sentence i would say it's not an eeg device it's a computer that sits on your head and also collects eeg data if you want you can literally connect a keyboard mouse and a screen to our headset and use it as a your daily driver laptop So that's also very, very interesting. I think you guys are building a complete infrastructure, and I guess you know. I mean, what's happening is that that the interactions has evolved over the years. I mean, you know, I mean, just if you go like around thirty years back, you know, the the, uh, the machine that we were using was like, I mean, you know, outdated, like computer key keyboards. You you go clack clack clack. You know, you use all your ten fingers. Then came mobiles in 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 the early two thousands, and then you started using thumbs, and then came brain computer interface, where we are actually using like you know just maybe. be possibly you know thoughts because you know control labs with facebook i think uh, is somewhere yeah. around 2017 or uh, demonstrated you know i mean just you know thought to text so i think our interface itself is changing and the infrastructure that you're building yeah. is going to kind of possibly you know create that future where interaction human computer interface uh, interaction is going to completely uh, up end uh, kudos to you and your team for thinking out you know so so far off i personally have been invested in metaverse you know since uh, the early 2016 like like i mentioned i also am part of shimaru entertainment lead the metaverse div- division we building out like complete uh, uh, city of sorts you know where uh, and people can come in and experience not just content but you know e-commerce and gaming yeah. and stuff like that uh, what are the interesting applications you see with B- bci because i mean I, i i i believe that you know in the next 10 years or tools or hand controls are, are, are also going to evolve you know because my son yeah. who is a 10 year old he is he he's He, he doesn't go to a regular physical school he he isn't he goes to an online school and he's mostly uh, i mean the he he interacts with his friends on platforms such as roblox and minecraft and, and things like that he's he's uh, on my quest 2 quest 3 tinkering around you know playing games so i i, I believe that the future of interaction to future of education future of uh, healthcare is, is going to be the convergence of this uh, this this like ai xr uh bci web trio what yep. utilities applications you see uh of v2 in the near term and, and the long term you know one of the biggest uh, advantage of building an infrastructure is uh, uh your customers tell you what are the applications uh right Uh, so we have uh, been seeing a lot of like interesting applications and uh, there are a couple of them on which like we ourselves are quite bullish uh, one as you rightly pointed out 
uh, you know talk to spare text you already have a couple of uh, you know customers a uh, couple of other new sense startups who are both, uh, using our v2 platform to uh, to do exactly that language reconstruction their initial use case is to use that language reconstruction for patient with cerebral palsy uh, but uh, when done to a bigger and a better extent it can be used by any person like uh, you know now uh, right if you see at like how the interaction with our machines increased like it all started with punch cards then it went to keyboards then came the mouse uh, then came the touch pad then came the touch screen uh, then now voice uh, and the obvious next step is uh, thoughts like there is nothing else left for your body to interact with right um, uh, so yeah language reconstruction is a like a good uh area that uh, we are looking and we are quite bullish about uh because it can solve uh, for a lot of problems so forget about like a, a complex forming complex sentences using your thoughts uh that may be uh still uh, like uh, i would say four to five years away but uh, short term things like you know productivity app- productivity application you want to make a quick note of something that take a note uh especially when you are in an environment like uh, apple vision pro let's say you are using an apple vision pro you are Uh, taking a look at some content or anything, and you're like, yeah, I want to take it a note of it. Right now, you have to move your hand to do all of that stuff. No, just think about it. Take a note. Uh, these simple actions, I think, so would be possible within the next one and a half to two years. Uh, right. Just using it with BCI and our in, in instant, uh, because that's what like we are working on. Uh, and then there are things like uh, you know, on the medical side of things, the healthcare side of things. Uh, <clears throat> Alzheimer's and cerebral palsy and epilepsy and Parkinson's. Uh, these are the four key areas that we see uh, that in the next four years we are going to see a, uh, like a lot of improvements both in treatment and diagnosis uh, of these and strokes uh, and concussions. So concussions and strokes uh, and epilepsy are the three areas on which next time is also working uh, with. Uh, uh other companies uh you know to use the instant platform for their diagnosis uh and in some case you know warning like epilepsy you can predict an epileptic seizure just by looking at a person's eeg signals right the problem is uh you you need a one you need a real time perfect algorithm which does that prediction that yeah you are about to get an epileptic seizure please inform someone or the device does the informing for you uh right and the second thing is uh wearing it uh, you have to wear it 24/7 so that uh, it never misses an epileptic seizure um <clears throat> but uh, stroke rehabilitation and concussions uh, you can uh, diagnose concussions instantaneously if you have eeg on device and uh, especially in a country like us in which uh, nfl is like literally the only sport they play, play. a uh, concussion becomes a huge deal in india uh <laughs> also concussion is a huge deal but in india the way of treating concussions is kind of wrong you just press the head <laughs> that let it go in um but uh, uh, yeah yeah in india that's one like one of the like uh, you know key insights that me and dipansh grow when it comes to into ndbs india has a bigger population than almost all the countries in the world but how come india doesn't have the most number of alzheimer's patients how come india doesn't have the most number of uh uh schizophrenic patients statistically it doesn't make sense all right we look a look at covid uh when we actually doing started doing proper testing yeah the reality was this india had the highest number of covid cases uh because that's what statistics always tells you uh the reason in, uh, why in india we don't see these is one uh, there's a lot of taboo around uh, ndds uh including mental health uh, forget ndds even mental health uh, i recently read a study that 50% of the it professionals are stressed and suffering from anxiety and depression uh no one bats an eye about uh, about them uh so that's uh, the ndds and uh, mental health that's the other segment that where uh, i personally feel that uh, instinct is going to help a lot instinct is going to help a lot uh, mental health and ndd uh and there are other use cases also uh, into the gaming industry like we are working with a excellent company uh 
can't take the name, but uh, we're working with an excellent company for essentially you know demystifying the whole concept of mental health. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, give neurofeedback sessions to uh, uh, people when they are thinking that they are actually playing a game, but in reality they are actually getting neurofeedback sessions. So uh, this is something very interesting, which we believe that uh, you know can help break that taboo around mental health and uh, help us solve that problem. Uh, education is another one. We are working with a startup called BrainHack. Uh, who are using uh, BCIs uh, and now are in the platform uh, to essentially, you know, one, improve uh, career counseling that's given to a student, you know, uh, and according to their focus patterns, you know, every human brain has a different focus pattern. You might be able to focus for 20 hours straight. I might not be able to do it for 20 minutes. If I'm not able to uh, focus for 20 minutes, that doesn't mean I have ADD. Uh, no, everyone has their own focus patterns. So like everyone has their own focus triggers. So that startup is essentially using the instinct platform for exactly this. So that uh, they can one, uh, give better counseling to students and two, better accommodate their learning experience so that it aligns with their focus pattern. And hence they capture the most amount of uh, learning that's possible. So yeah, these are the key medical healthcare, uh, uh, you know, uh, metaverse essentially meta in metaverse like club AR, VR, game, all of them together, and uh, <clears throat> mental uh, education. These are the four uh, bigger ones that we see within the next five years. We are going to take huge uh, differences into. Now, to go beyond that, yeah, uh, we have to address the elephant in the room, which is the headset. I I think you know the AR, VR tech faces a similar challenge, yeah. you know, because I, I think from 2014, when Palmer Lucky kind of, you know, created Oculus VR, sold it to Facebook, th these were very bulky devices, you know, and cut to 2024, we have companies, uh, you know, who are created lightweight headsets, both AR, VR, MR, which look pretty much similar to something like this, though these are not production ready, but th th these are developed. And I also believe that the miniaturization of technology is going to play a huge role huge. In, 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 you know, nanotech and things like that in creating the next generation of brain computer interface technology both invasive as as well as non-invasive and you know, non-invasive those micro electrodes you know which is going to go more smaller and smaller and, and possibly maybe it'll go towards maybe something which is uh, non-invasive maybe uh, as tiny as what maybe has been represented or shown in those black mirror series yeah. where it's just a clip on and then you know it kind of reads up the entire uh you, you know your, your cognitive data. So I, I think, yes, the future looks really, really promising. But all of the technologies has come to a point where especially these uh, transformative or disruptive technologies. And when, when I say this, you know, I, 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 I mean, you know, artificial intelligence, your brain computer interface, nanotechnology, uh, AR, VR, MR, I, I think they've all have these equal pros as well as cons, you know, pros are, I mean, it can completely upend society and how we live, work and play. The cons are, I mean, you know, AI can go towards AGI and once it goes towards AGI, I think we're going into a land where we don't completely understand because the models today, the way it's trained on, it's trained on our data and still seems to be a black box. We don't really understand its complete functioning. You spoke about or lack of understanding of the human brain. So brain computer interface, you know, when you build these brain computer interfaces, pros are, I mean, you know, we can completely upend the healthcare industry, not just the education, gaming and, and other industries, the healthcare in, in industry, I think is, especially you may mentioned about this neuro neurological disorders. I think these, these are like really, really big problem. You, may, you spoke about cerebral palsy and uh, other, uh, other schizophrenia i mean these these are like big yeah. challenges and i'm sure i'll be able to solve it but then there's this other side which is depicted in you know these series such as black mirror and what happens you know when 
you get into a virtual world because like i said about metaverse i mean metaverse pros are i mean you know education is going to be personalized but you know it also uh, holds the potential of creating these virtual worlds which will be indistinguishable from the uh, or, or reality you know which has already been shown in movies such as matrix you know like you know the, in in fact you know movies such as matrix promote that you know that they or, or show that you know we are already in a simulation and there are people such as donald hoffman uh, nick boston elon musk and many others who actually say that we are currently living in a simulation simulated world i personally have been invested in like i mentioned i mean a couple of times that in the ar vr industry since longest time and i feel that the pros are it's loaded the cons are that you know we can create a virtual world if, which would be indistinguishable from uh, 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 re- yep. reality so so what are the the cons the ethical conundrums you think you you worry about when it comes to brain computer interfaces uh from an ethical standpoint like this has created a huge problem uh you know simply so, uh, because of the fact because once bc has reached that stage uh, right uh once privacy goes out of garbage like what is your thought there won't be any original thought uh right uh, because uh, you can always measure it you can always compute it You don't even need to speak to say it. Uh, a computer knows all the thoughts, uh, even the most abstract thoughts. So that's where, like, it. Uh, you know, I if I'm not wrong, there's in a project called Library of Babel or something like that, where you can type anything, and it would be there in that book, right? That's what essentially BCS can become. You can think of anything, and it will be like, yeah, I, I, you've already thought that before, or someone else has already thought. so uh, that's one of the like you know bigger cons that i see be say but i don't see that happening for at least the next 20 years uh, uh but yeah like uh, once you you know master the human brain you know every single part process coming up with original thought which uh, if you look at it is the essence of uh, humanity originality creativity kind of goes away uh we saw this with genai you know when genai started doing creative work there was a huge uproar around that uh, based on exactly the same principle um so bcs can also do that and another bigger con that i see of bcs uh is uh, essentially uh around when it's used in combination uh, with a tech like uh, metaverse the disconnection that you can create from the real life is just too much we love dreaming now imagine that you can live in a world which is your dream <clears throat> so that disconnect can be on just uh, another level and uh, you know once someone asked me about a dystopian future like what's the dystopian version of bci that's when i said that a uh, dystopian version of uh, bci is is a very excellent bci system if you think about it makes the human body a limitation your brain can think of flying you can uh your body becomes a limit so if we have an excellent a uh, bci system we would consider our bodies to be waste uh mm-hmm. you know because uh biomechanics can do a better job they be stronger they be better they be faster and that's the dystopian view of future i look at that the only thing that exists are the human brain the uh, right. rest of the body is kind of uh, gone to waste which means we have stopped the natural progression of evolution completely we have the only currency in the world has become power uh, like as in like uh, power as in electrical power uh, which ai has already started taking us into that direction like right now the biggest currency in the world is not gold it's not diamonds it's who has the most number of uh, uh, dams and who has the most number of nuclear power plants we are already started going to that direction because of ai because of the power consumption so bcs will also uh, you know further push in us into that direction uh and kind of make us lose the meaning of what it means to be human and bci makes you immortal essentially exactly exactly you know so so great insights adant i think you know what you kind of uh, said is very profound because the next uh currency is going to be possibly power i mean electricity you know and that's what's happening with these llms you know these power hungry 
LLMs, you know, GPU, Elon Musk, and Elon, and, and somehow, if if you go to see, I mean, though maybe this is slightly in in, in a woo woo tangent. I mean, the entire world is created out of a single atom, you know, uh, the the Big yeah. Bang, and, and everything is. If you see, I, I mean. everything is electric like for example i mean some, somehow i kind of think whether we how much biological are we and how much electrical are we because yeah. you know our, our brains uses electrons to fire our neurons and synapses to create a sight sound touch smell taste our body has trillions of cells which fires with electric cells to kind of you know create these proteins and so on and so forth yeah. we we say we are biological but we are somehow deep down we are electrical there was a very very in, insightful a uh, thing you said the currency is going to be power electric uh nasidan would you like to leave us behind with your last thoughts on the future of next time uh, where do you see next time uh and paint a picture of your your vision of the world that you would want uh to see on the good side of things you know we can use bsa for so much uh, like good as you uh, rightly said that uh healthcare industry can be revolutionized uh, with bcis uh <clears throat> and you know amputations no longer uh, will remain a uh, limitation to someone uh they might actually make someone better uh right <clears throat> uh so bcis can like that's the like good picture i uh, think about bcis uh depression anxiety like you know both uh, basically bcis are the clue to uh, you know solving the mystery of physical fitness and mental fitness and once you solve that those two clues right that's when we can actually focus on making the world better <clears throat> right now because we have not solved one of these two things essentially we have not solved these two things that's where like uh, the greed and everything else comes in then which you know spoils the pot altogether but if you have solved these two problems for everyone that you are physically fit you are mentally fit uh that's when we can actually take care of what we are supposed to take care of so that's the good picture i want to leave so it can go both ways <laughs> right right uh, we start yeah. taking care of things or we just uh, destroy everything uh uh and uh, so uh, bcs have a huge huge application when it comes to space exploration um or uh, even self driving cars you know Right now, the ethical conundrum in self-driving cars is there's a old lady, there's a young child, which you have to kill someone. Who will who will who will kill? AI can't make that decision, but BCI, when in com- combined with AI, can at least make a human-like decision. Um, uh, right. There are already so, cars, uh, by the way, Mercedes and Nissan who yeah, are Mercedes, using BCI. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 uh mercedes does uh, oh in terms of bci you will be surprised the amount of companies use bci l'oreal uses so all the perfumes that l'oreal makes you know they are actually bci products they use bci to find the scents which you know trigger your olfactory response and make you attractive and that's how they create this uh, scents the amount of companies use bci uh, is just tremendous and that's again another pro and con of bcis you can use bcis to make product uh, which make everyone happy but at the same time you can use that same product to you know sell a propaganda right right uh, um so yeah bcis pros and cons simply put i will just put it as equivalent to any great technology that we have created like uh, uh when we uh, created the atom bomb uh bcs also stand uh, like uh, in terms of impact that it can have as seen like ai has the same impact as the uh, nuclear energy as uh, e equal to mc square semiconductors industry had the same impact as e equals to mc square that's where bcs also stands in, into the place and eventually it comes down to you know the early risk takers and that's where next thing comes into the picture uh to not restrict but at the same time be ethical um uh, explore but uh, you know keep a chain uh to uh, your exploration limits uh, learn to say no uh you know we have got thousands of requests from a lot of customers who have asked us for something very very specific uh the use cases are interesting to uh, look into but we have kept it as like you no know, 
that's not something that uh, is ethical uh, for next time i would say as a company the definition of ethical ethics is uh, quite simple and that's what we follow in our research and development also which is uh, uh, <clears throat> advantage should not come at the disadvantage of uh, that's the philosophy that we work uh, with uh, that's the philosophy we are incorporating in our products and that's what our responsibility as a bc as of uh, you know a deep tech frontier tech company comes into place that uh, so that's what we follow um uh, i told you the pictures about uh, past and future next time where next time's uh, immediate uh, focus is going to be is to solve the bigger problem in neuroscience which is miniaturization you know <clears throat> Qualcomm solved that for uh, uh, VR AR by creating their VR AR chip. Uh, you know, um, that's where like Nexon is also heading towards uh, to essentially solve the problem of miniaturization, and uh, that's our you know plan for the next five years to come. Right. Uh, our goal is to essentially like one of the things that we are uh, soon gonna release in like I would say uh, early twenty twenty, sorry late twenty twenty five. is uh, going to be a coin uh, a singular coin that you can place anywhere on your head to record your brain signals uh, and the thing coin you can pay up put it on your chest or to record the ecg on your muscles to record it you know complete by signal package essentially uh, <clears throat> so it's an attempt essentially i would say uh, in solving the problem of uh, form fact you know solve like addressing the elephant in the room uh, and that's like our uh, is going to be our time to focus for the next five years uh, perfect min- miniature is it perfect sidant thank you for taking time and being part of the podcast like you rightfully pointed out i think tech is is a double edged sword it's it's got its pros as well as cons it's almost like yin and yang you know and that's the way life yeah. is always has and always will be there's nothing completely white or not completely uh, you know black it's it's the middle line that we humans traverse and we if we traverse <coughs> carefully i think we we'll, we'll uh, uh, get into the age of ab- abundance as far as next time i think you guys are doing something really really exceptional uh, more power to you and your entire team looking forward not just for the next iteration of v2 I- I- instinct i yeah. uh, would love to experience it, but also this coin that you're talking about i guess we get getting into a world of wearables i mean you know in a world where uh, everything is going to be digitized internet of things you know i mean from your glasses from the, the, the where, where you drink your water to the 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 pot that you sh- uh, sit on to uh, relieve yourself in the morning you know everything is going to collect data and that data is, is going to take you towards a world where it's going to be personalized uh, e- education uh, as well as healthcare it's going to give you a better make you better and i i think this convergence of tech uh, tech stack you know right from ai which is taking us from you know the world where we used to code to natural language coding you know we are getting into a world where i think coding might get redundant to this brain computer interface to ar vr ar vr mr great great things but like i like i said yin and yang if we travel caf- carefully in, in the middle we will we'll get into the future of an abundance looking forward for the coin that you're talking about wish you and the team the very best and to my listeners if you like what you see in here then please press the subscribe button until next time see you guys bye bye thank you thank you so much really appreciate this Adios.